welcome to Global Connections. I'm Patrick Bratton here with you again today, and I've got a special guest with me, one of my colleagues, Dr. John David N., Professor of History at Hawaii Pacific University. So, welcome to ThinkTech. Thanks very much, Patrick. Happy to be here. Now, you've been on uh, various ThinkTech shows before in the past, right? I have, yes, a number of ThinkTech shows. In fact, recently I was on a ThinkTech show with Jay talking about the Brexit. Oh, interesting. Yes. Okay. <laughs> now, that was fun. You as a professor of history, I mean, you've been here at HBU for a number of years, um, but I'm, I'm to understand that you're an upper north uh, Midwesterner, right? That's true. Born and raised in Minnesota, went to the University of Minnesota Morris for my undergraduate and the University of Minnesota Minneapolis for my graduate degrees. So, you know, just Minnesotan through and through, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I got a job offer to come to Hawaii, and sure enough, I uh, moved my family here in 1997. It's been here almost 20 years. Oh. Uh, so I'm, I'm, am I Kamaaina? I hope so. We can all aspire, right? Okay, that's aspire. correct. I mean, you never really know for sure, but I, I think I am at this point. So, mm. um, yeah. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, you, you, have a, you have a long, distinguished career as a historian of Asia and U.S.-Asia relations. I mean, Minnesota has always had this reputation for Asian studies as well, yes? Yeah, that's interesting. You know, we, the University of Minnesota has, and, uh, you know, we're in the middle of the country, landlocked. Well, I guess uh, Lake Superior, but really landlocked. Mm. Uh, but I think that's part of the reason why Minnesotans have reached out so far in the globe, because we're so like, uh, okay, it's the minute in the middle of a Minnesota winter, you're freezing cold, you can't go anywhere, not even outside your home. Mm. And so I think it's produced this kind of thirst for uh, adventure and, and internationalism among Minnesotans. Um, so, I, when I was an undergraduate, I did uh, an exchange program at the uh, University of Minnesota and I went to the University of Essex in Colchester, England. Um, I also spent some time as a resident manager at uh, uh, a house on the University of Minnesota campus which had uh, people, uh, students from all over the world and uh, that was great fun. And uh, then I started studying uh, U.S. East Asian relations through the YMCA. And the YMCA is an organization that went all over the world in its missionary work, set up branches in Japan, in China, then in uh, Southeast Asia, in the Philippines, uh, all, over the, all over East Asia and Southeast Asia. So uh, my interest in in uh, the YMCA really kind of led me to East Asia. Mm. And from there, you know, I've written books on U.S. East Asian relations and traveled there quite often, so. Why, why the YMCA? I mean, was it a, a little too much disco or? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, actually, the, the, the thing about the YMCA is the archives are in, in Min at the University of Minnesota. Oh, okay, interesting. So, so uh, we, I actually had a graduate course in the archives on the YMCA. So uh, every time that graduate course met, then I would take some time afterwards and I would walk through the archives and would see all these boxes. And when it came time to choose my uh, dissertation topic, I thought, okay, uh, China, 150 page boxes, way too much. Mm. Okay. Japan, uh, 15 page boxes, that's doable. Mexico, 15 page boxes, that's also doable. So I called up the, the academic advisor for Mexico. He said, I'm not interested in that at all. So I thought, okay, I'm not gonna do Mexico. <laughs> sure. So then it was Japan. Mm -hmm. And the Japan advisor was very supportive. So uh, that's kind of how I got to the YMCA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, I, I mentioned also to sort of the zeitgeist of the, the time period. I mean, you know, with the sort of many people talking about the rise of Japan back then and, uh, and a lot of the, the tri both the, the sort of love-hate relationship that we, we had with Japan, you know, but both having a strong security relationship but all those years of sort of Japan bashing oh, and it, things like that at that time. Yes, I mean, this, uh, this was the late 1980s and mm -hmm. you're exactly right. You know, the Japanese were on the rise. They bought Rockefeller Center, seemed that they were taking over the world. And of course, I was, you know, not oblivious to that, engaged in that. So you're, you're right that that was also very influential. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, how have you? I mean, one of the things that's that's interesting is that you know, as Mark Twain says, you know, the past doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Right? <laughs> right. Right. And so a lot of the language that we've heard the past ten or fifteen years about the rise of China, China buying everything, right. and all those sorts of things. I mean, 
I, I detect echoes of that earlier sort of period people concerned about Japan uh, yeah. back you know, yeah. 20, 25 yeah. years ago. Yeah. I mean, do you see sort of similarities too as well, or do you see important differences? Well, th there are definitely similarities between that time and this. Of course, the, uh, the China's economic muscle is similar to what Japan had in the late 1980s, where there were, the Japanese were coming to Hawaii and buying things uh, with cash, uh, doubling home prices here in Hawaii in, the, in 1988. Uh, and so there's some of that same thing going on in, you know, in Manhattan and other, you know, Los Angeles, other parts of the U.S. with Chinese money. So that's definitely happening. Uh, the, the economic uh, threat or the economic competition between the United States and China is, is real, and in some ways it resembles that economic competition between Japan and the United States. But I think the big difference is that China represents more than an economic threat, it represents a military threat. Whereas Japan never did. Japan, of course, was a security ally of the United States. Japan had a very small army, uh, no offensive capability in the 1980s. Uh, and the United States had essentially built the Japanese army by giving Japan uh, surplus weapons, and kind of second generation technology in its security agreements, mm. those kinds of things could be transferred to Japan. So th that's, I think, the big difference is in terms of regional hegemony in East Asia, the Japanese never represented a, a military threat, but the Chinese represent a very real military threat to the United States in the region of, of East Asia and the Pacific. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it kind of gets at some of the aspects. You're, you're embarking on a lot of uh, interesting research projects uh, this summer and into this fall. And you've got, I want to talk about some of the two tracks yeah. that you're doing. And yeah. I think the, the, <coughs> what we've just mentioned really feeds into that. I mean, one thing that uh, might sound a little esoteric when we start, but one of the things you're interested in is sort of these conceptions of modernity. And if we think about the rise of Japan, the rise of China, or much of the rest of Asia, in, in many instances, it's these countries grappling with mixing Western and Asian concepts of modernity and development and, and, and so on. I mean, it, it's kind of, I mean, it seems in a sense an easy thing to think about, but on the other hand, if we think about modernity, it can be quite complex. I mean, how would you, how would you frame this so that our, our, yeah. our watchers can sort of come to terms with right, it? Right, right. So, so the way that I've framed it in the book is to talk about, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm looking at influences. What were the influence on, on Japanese and Chinese intellectuals and then American intellectuals? And then I'm really looking at modernity through the lens of rationalism, you know, mm -hmm. scientific rationalism, the idea of progress, and then uh, seeing how the intellectuals themselves shaped or shaped their definitions of modernity. And that includes, uh, in East Asia, a very strong emphasis on the nation mm. as being kind of uh, the, the locus of modern thinking and the locus of modern life. Uh, not so much in the U.S., although I think it's still important in the U.S., so nationalism is also part of that. And then uh, modernity is typically defined as uh, also having the kind of the unfettered individual, in the, uh, the agency of the individual. And one of the things that surprised me in my research is that you find any number of Japanese and Chinese intellectuals who believe in the cultivation of the individual in a, almost a very American kind of way, uh, which I didn't expect to find. Mm. But what's going on there is that Confucianism has within it a very strong strain of the cultivation of the individual. Chu Shi Confucianism, which is really the traditional Confucianism, and it, which is really the one that's taught in the schools in China and Japan, has this very strong emphasis on the cultivation of the individual. And the intellectuals that I studied uh, in, this, in the early time period, in the late 19th century, also have that idea that you need to free and cultivate the individual in order to have a successful nation and in turn to modernize or make that nation modern. Interesting, because I mean, all, often when you, you take courses on history of Asia, or Asian culture, and so on, I mean, a shorthand that's often used in the West for understanding sort of Asian culture, Asian history, is, is to de-emphasize the individual, exactly. and the, you, we've got this sort of collective identity and hierarchies and so on and so forth. So are you saying that perhaps that's 
not necessarily always the case, or perhaps that's... Yeah, I think that's been overemphasized mm. in, in American curriculums, and certainly in American stereotypes about East Asians, that's absolutely the case, that we've, we've kind of lost... Uh, a, a real analysis of Japan and China in this idea of groupism. Mm -hmm. um, now, you can, of course, even today, you can find some vestiges of, of the old kind of loyalty and duty uh, values of the, of the pre-modern period in, uh, in Japan and China. But, but those, I mean, they're, they're still a part of the culture, but they're not, uh, you know, central, I would say. Yeah. Oh, we've got a, a picture, I think, we just had of your, your book on the YMCA, right, right? Right, Well, this is actually, this was actually one book after mm -hmm. the YMCA. That book was a study of cultural diplomacy between the U.S. and Japan in the period before World War II. And I think uh, one of the things about that book that's important is uh, it it's shows that the relationship between the United States and Japan deteriorated not just at the official level, the State Department to foreign ministry, but it also deteriorated at the unofficial level. A kind of people's diplomacy was very engaged between the United States and Japan. And yet, in the 1930s, when the Japanese invade Manchuria and then they invade China, you know, the rest of China in 1937, uh, that unofficial relationship begins to deteriorate long before the official one does. And it, it's, it's like a, it's a, a premonition or a foreshadowing of those major tensions that are to come. One of the arguments I make in the book is that by the late 1930s, then you have no, uh, because the, the people's diplomacy has really fallen apart, mm. you have no way for unofficial or informal channels of communication between the United States and Japan. Okay. So then, you know, when the actual uh, official relationship, you know, falls apart, then mm -hmm. you have no way to go behind. Go, there's no back doors for the United States and Japan at that point. And I think it contributes to uh, the, the, the march to war in 1939 to 1941. Just to clarify for our watchers, I mean, what's the difference between sort of diplomacy as we normally conceptualize it and what you've termed sort of cultural diplomacy? Right, right. So cultural diplomacy is actually uh, the work of peoples and ideas and what we would term culture. Art, architecture, you know, the transmission of, uh, or the send, you sending books back and forth, building libraries. Uh, so it's, so it's, Culture as we have kind of traditionally defined it, only when we think about it in terms of diplomacy, it's, it's using uh, those art forms or other forms of culture as a way to actually do diplomacy. Mm. And it can be official in that the State Department actually sent musicians on tours in the 1950s and 60s. Oh, sure. Benny Goodman going to the USSR, right? E exactly. Or Louis Armstrong mm -hmm. going to Egypt. You know, there are lots of examples here. That was cultural diplomacy done by the State Department. But you also have lots of private examples of cultural diplomacy. Uh, for instance, um, uh, American missionaries to Japan coming back from Japan and setting up the institution called the Institute of Pacific Relations in 1925, established, founded right here in Honolulu, uh, and it became a very important forum for doing cultural diplomacy between the United States and Japan, hmm. uh, trying to find common interests and, and doing research projects in East Asia and some research projects in Japan. So ultimately it fell apart. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, IPR became kind of an arm of the American government in World War II. But for a time there, they, they engaged in some very creative one-to-one -one, uh, cultural diplomacy, and they didn't even want the State, State Department involved. Interesting. Well, we'll, um, we'll stop for a second here, and we'll come back after a couple of announcements. Aloha, I'm Chantel Seville, host of the Savvy Chick Show on Think Tech Hawaii. This show is for you. It's all about inspiring and empowering girls of the future to do what they love, get out there and be healthy, fit and confident. If you're up for that, 11 a.m. every Wednesday, I'll see you there. Aloha. My name is Carl Campagna and I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers and Reformers. I invite you to come watch our show on thinktechhawaii.com. You can also see our shows on YouTube. 
as well, if you can Google search those. I appreciate the time. I hope that you do join us as we learn about education, about the educational system here in Hawaii, what the challenges are, what the benefits are, and how much our kids are learning. So thank you. I hope you join us. Hello, welcome back to Global Connections. I'm Patrick Bracken. I'm talking with John David M. We're talking about sort of culture diplomacy and conceptions of modernity in Asia. Before the break, John was sort of describing to us the differences between sort of traditional sort of track one diplomacy versus other types of sort of non-official diplomacy, cultural diplomacy. I mean, one of the things I was curious a bit to kind of jump back to an earlier point that you had made about modernity and Asian conceptions of modernity. What role does, say, education and educational exchanges uh, play? Because, you know, at face value, when we think about the influences of modernity in, in Asia, the easy way that people look at it is to look at people from Asia who go to the U.S. or go to Europe, right. do studies, and come right. back. So, right. for example, you know, the father of the Indian Constitution, Dr. Ambedkar, he studied in the U.S. Right. and was right. in some ways influenced um, in comparison to some of his other uh, Indian independence mm -hmm. leaders that were more influenced by mm -hmm. sort of their time in, in the U.K. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we see that in Asia, people like Sun Yat-sen or some of these other right. figures right. Right. as right. well? So, very good question and an important part of the book, actually. Well, so Sun Yat-sen, and Chiang Kai-shek and Liang Qichao, who I, I actually have a picture of him if you, if, uh, if you want to pull up the, some of those pictures. Um, uh, they and uh, uh, that's actually a picture of the Japanese, Japanese parliament, yeah. yeah, the parliament building. That's, that's where I was doing my research, not at the diet, but right, right across the street. But uh, that's a beautiful area it, in Tokyo, it's, Akasaka. It's, it's a very pretty mm -hmm. area. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the things uh, about Liang is that he didn't study in the U.S. Liang studied in Japan, as oh. well as Chiang Kai-shek and Sun Yat-sen. Mm. And many others, most intellectuals from East Asia actually didn't come to the United States in the, the first couple of generations. <clears throat> they went to Japan, especially Chinese, mm. who would have had the opportunity maybe to go to the United States. Many of, the, many of those most influential leaders and intellectuals actually ended up in Japan. And part of the reason why is they were very interested in the, in the Japanese success. Because the Japanese in the late 19th century had thrown off forms of informal imperialism from the West, the unequal treaties essentially. Uh, they had modernized mm -hmm. their economy and they had begun to be, look like at least a modern nation mm -hmm. in East Asia. It was astonishing for Westerners, but it was also astonishing. Now, that's, that's actually Fukuzawa, who actually helped in the modernization of Japan, mm. and really is the first great, maybe the greatest Japanese intellectual of the 19th and the 20th century. Uh, but Fukuzawa argued that the individual had to be made free in Japan in order for the Japanese nation to become free and independent. Mm. He wanted to overthrow the old Tokugawa system of, of loyalties, uh, you know, the, the kind of loyalty to your lord. He believed that was a terrible system. So Fukuzawa was very influential. Fukuzawa actually did go to the United States, not to study, but, but as a part of diplomatic missions. Um, so there's some influence, there's some Western influence on Fukuzawa. But Fukuzawa is seen by Americans and, and Japanese and even academic historians today as a Westernizer, pure and simple. Mm. And what I've done in the book is really... Uh, reconceptualized Fukuzawa's role and argued that no, no, he's not just a westernizer. He's actually taking from his own traditions, he's taking from the West, and he's really conceiving of Japan as this place that, uh, that, that the Japanese people need to become independent individuals. It's really, it's totally surprising to me. Hmm. Um, so, so Liang, and Liang's is the next picture on that slideshow, uh, this is Liang Qichao right there as mm -hmm. a young man. And Liang actually, uh, he's a part of a, uh, a reform movement in the late uh, 1890s. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, the reform movement falls apart. Uh, Empress Cixi steps in and threatens to kill him and uh, Kang Yue. Mm. They flee. And where do they go? They go to Japan. Liang spends the next several years in Japan and actually uh, really is very deeply influenced by Japanese modernization, by Japanese intellectuals. 
when Leung reads about the West, he goes to the West, but much later. Mm. Uh, when he reads about the West, he actually gets his information from, through Japanese translations mm. of Western texts. So uh, Leung's influence from Japan is very heavy. Uh, Leung is also interested in a, what we call a neo-Confucianist approach of Wang Yang Ming thought. This is getting a little complex, but essentially Wang was a provincial governor. He was also an intellectual. But he needed people who were willing to help out, mm. willing to be good citizens and kind of uh, loyal to the governor, willing to work hard for the good of the people. Um, and this is how Liang conceives of how, what, what China has to do to become more modern. Its population must become more loyal, more devoted to the cause of China, more willing to work hard for China, kind of, kind of the Machiavellian type of men of courage. Right. The Chinese need men of courage <laughs> to fight for China, and Liang identifies this in Wang Yang Ming thought. So Liang has less often been presented as a pure westernizer, but he's still presented within that framework of the westernization of, of China, and this is a mistake. So I, I, part of the book is correcting that, revising that, and showing La, Liang as a very complex individual with a lot of different influences. One of the things I'm, you mentioned this influence and in how everyone's studying Japan. I read a few years ago that, re, that relatively recent biography of Chiang Kai-shek and learning right. about how influential that time was for him going to Japan that right. really marked his outlook and one could almost even say his way of life. Yeah. But this is kind of interesting paradox or irony of all of these people from various parts of Asia coming to Japan to learn to think about nationalism, independence from colonialism, only to have Japan inflict colonialism oh. on them 10 or so years <laughs> later. And, and I'm struck by this kind of irony of when, yes. like say colonial powers in Europe, they would take in the elites from their colonies and train them to school and they'd come back with these ideas of Rousseau and individualism. Yeah. Hey, wait a second, right? Yeah. Why are, if we, no. we were taught individualism democracy, why are we colonial subjects? I mean, yeah. do you have a, it's kind of the similar sort of paradox with all of these people who were, went to Japan to learn about modernity and being independent Asians at the same time time later Japan tried to colonize them. Yes, yeah, you'd, I mean, it is a similar kind of thing. Um, is uh, Chiang Kai-shek using uh, his Japanese kind of influenced ideas against Japan in the 1930s or to free himself from Japanese power? Not so much, it, so it's not quite a direct parallel mm -hmm. to like Gandhi who uses Western ideas against the West. Uh, but I think there are some similarities there, mm -hmm. definitely, yeah. So actually, there was the what was just on the screen was my visit to the UNESCO archives right oh, there. Yes, and this is okay. I wasn't attending parties all week, but this was it a looks little, quite festive, John. <laughs> it's <laughs> too festive, maybe. But but I was this was just a party at the end of the week. But the UNESCO ar archives were really fascinating and um, fascinating because of course there's this tense relationship between the United States government and UNESCO, mm. and I looked into the roots of that. This is the other project. This is the Cultural Diplomacy Project. So uh, that was great fun, but also kind of a, blew me away. I mean, what, what's something that, for okay. you, give, us, give so, us a nugget. So there's another slide in there, uh, not the United Nations. That's actually before this. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the United Nations, though. So, and, and that's my trip to Japan. To, that's, so I've got two projects here going, mm -hmm. and we're kind of flipping between the two. But this is me and two, Sam, uh, two sumo, uh, junior sumo. They get bigger than that, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, over time. Do you, do you have that? There's that traditional sumo wrestler dish that you can eat. No, I, I've never eaten it. It's, it's quite good. I've been by <laughs> really? the, the stables one okay, time. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I asked these two guys. I, the archives was closed, just mm -hmm. to be clear. Uh, so I went in, in search for the sumo basho, which is the tournament. Mm -hmm. And I found these two guys, and they were walking. And I thought, I'm not going to ask them for their picture. Mm -hmm. This Japanese older man runs up to me and says, No, no, I'll ask them for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, really? They, they couldn't crush me. But uh, that was perfectly fine. They were very friendly. Um, so it, during that trip, I was at the National Archives of Japan mm -hmm. and uh, got some good information on, on some intellectuals closer to World War II and during World War II. But going back to my other project, the Cultural Diplomacy Project, I was both, this spring, I was in Geneva at the United Nations and that was the one picture. And then I was also at the UNESCO archives at the UNESCO building in Paris. Mm -hmm. 
and they were both very fruitful. And you see the picture there. The UNESCO material was very interesting because in the late 70s, in the early days, there were real tensions between the United States government and UNESCO. And the U U.S. government cuts off funding. But there are always those who support the ideals of UNESCO, which is education, science, and culture, really to spread it internationally, to do education, to promote these things globally. And so that was actually the cover of a, a, a pamphlet, a promotional pamphlet, to, to try to argue that UNESCO was a good thing for the U.S. and for the world. So the research was fascinating, the food was fantastic, and I had a very good time. I mean, there are worse places to do research than <laughs> Paris and Geneva. Of That's right. W where are you here? That's actually the UN archives there in Geneva. And uh, this was remodeled in 2012 with money from the Rockefeller Foundation. Oh. And the Rockefeller Foundation actually contributed money to build the archives in the first place. Uh, so I thought it was very interesting that they still have, they're still involved, they're still committed to the ideals of the UN. We've just got a, uh, we've just got a, a minute or two left yeah. on the show. I want to maybe, so what, you're, what are you planning to do maybe in the future? Where is, the, where is John David N. moving in terms of research? Well, the two projects are really a lot. It's <laughs> probably too much right now. So I'm hoping in the fall that I can get the one project, the Modernities Project. I have five chapters on that. Mm -hmm. So I, it's a seven-chapter book. I, I'm hoping to finish those two chapters in the fall with the sabbatical that I got. And then I hope to get at least one chapter done on the Cultural Diplomacy Project, the U.S. Cultural Diplomacy Project, and try to work on that through the spring and the summer I'm going uh, off to Washington, D.C. and then New York City for more research on that project in a little bit here. And hopefully just stay home, maybe next summer just stay home for the most part and just write like crazy to try to finish that project. So the Cultural Diplomacy Project I envision as a project which has uh, a wider audience. Mm. So I hope to turn that into a trade book. Oh, okay, uh, interesting. But, uh, you know, a, a book for a wider audience. Uh, we'll see if that works out or not. But I, th I think it's a very important project because when you look, I mean, it's, when, when you look at American internationalism right now, it's really dominated by the American military presence and, and the American focus on militarization because of the, the terrorism threat. And uh, that's kind of, it's distorted. Mm-hmm. The historically distorted the way that the United States has approached internationalism. <clears throat> so I'm hoping with the second book to, to demonstrate that historically the United States has, has done a lot of cultural diplomacy, has not relied on the military exclusively, and that in some cases has been very successful in its cultural diplomacy. Kind of provide a model or a template for going back to a more balanced approach to our diplomatic efforts. Excellent. Well, yeah. we look forward to having you on again, maybe as you get done with the project, and talk about that. Well, thank you very much, John, for coming and speaking to us at Global Connections. No problem. I'm happy to do it. Excellent. And I was Patrick Bratton here with Global Connections, and I'll see you guys again next week.